it is a great pleasure to introduce our next D3 speaker, uh, Dr. Danielle Martin. Uh, you know her uh, probably because she's had uh, millions of views of her uh, Senate hearing, uh, but she is also an author of Better Now, and uh, I guess if you're going to name a book or subtitle it Six Big Ideas, you better have ideas. The, the thing I like about um, Dr. Martin, and the reason I'm really uh, eager to hear her talk, is that she's a believer in our system. A lot of Canadians like to trash our system um, as though there's some better alternative out there. I find it frustrating uh, because we are pretty lucky in this country to have the, the system we do, but it's not perfect. And the best people to tell us how to fix it are people who actually uh, work in it and believe in it uh, because then we might actually listen to them and do something. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Danielle Martin. Please give her a warm welcome. Thanks, Amanda. Good afternoon, thanks for having me. <clears throat> so a chorus of voices has been getting louder all over the world over the last many months. Voices across the gender spectrum demanding that we pay attention in this country and all over the world to a set of issues that women face every single day. Domestic violence, sexual assault, workplace harassment, income gaps, power gaps. These voices are emerging from social media movements like Me Too and Time's Up, from survivors of sexual assault, from women in leadership, and from women in Hollywood, from our daughters, and our mothers, and our sisters, and our wives, and from the men who support them. Britt Marling is an actress and screenwriter who was among the over 80 women who came forward about the sexual assault they experiences they had had under Harvey Weinstein. And Marling pointed out early on that part of what gave Weinstein his power was that he could ensure that women would never work again if they came forward about their experiences with him. So as she put it, that's not just artistic or emotional exile. That's economic exile. The abuse of economic power via sexuality is not just an issue in Hollywood. When you go back to your offices tomorrow, take a moment to think about the fact that nearly half of Canadian women have experienced sexual harassment in the workplace. Women like Sandra Pesqueda, a former dishwasher in a resort in California whose supervisor pursued her for months, and when she rebuffed him, he changed her schedule and cut her hours. Racialized women are at even higher risk than white women of that kind of abuse. But it isn't just women who some might perceive as powerless. More than half of our currently sitting women members of parliament report that they themselves have been suggested, su subjected to one or more forms of sexual misconduct while in office. Rachel Dunn-Hollander was among the 150 women who came forward about Larry Nassar's predatory sexual abuse, abuse that took place over the span of 20 years in that safest of spaces, the doctor's office. Now there's been a lot of talk about what a monster this guy is, but actually it took the participation of hundreds of adults for that to be allowed to happen. And as Rachel put it, this is what it looks like when people in authority refuse to listen, when they put friendships in front of the truth, when they fail to create or enforce proper policy and to hold enablers accountable. This is not a one-off story. Assault against young girls, as you've just heard, is terrifyingly common in our society, and it occurs most often at the hands of a known and trusted man, a coach, a teacher, a pastor, a relative, a parent. Violence against women takes so many forms, and some of them truly are shocking. Approximately every six days here in Canada, a woman is killed by her intimate partner. People like this woman, Dr. Alana frick a family doctor like me, whose alleged murderer, her neurosurgeon husband, worked at a hospital just across the street from where we're sitting today. So there's a reason why the Me Too movement has opened up a conversation across every single sector of our society. It's because these stories resonate with us. 
They represent something that we all know needs to somehow be addressed. Millions of people are calling for change, for the end of a culture of complicity that holds women back from participating in our society to their greatest potential. And we are calling for that change in every sector, in every facet of our society, from our boardrooms, where women continue to be underrepresented as governors and as C-suite leaders, to our academic institutions, where they are regularly assaulted in dorm rooms and underrepresented as full professors, to our healthcare system, which is where I work as a family doctor and as a hospital administrator and as someone who is passionate about improving our system for everyone. So I've spent my own career working to try to improve Medicare, and some of you have heard me speak about the big ideas for improving our system that I talk about in my book, which came out last year. Through the stories of my own family and my own patients, I've been out there talking about issues like the importance of universal coverage for prescription drugs, reducing unnecessary tests and prescriptions, and an emphasis on relationship-based primary care for all Canadians. I've spoken about these ideas across the country over the past year, and I have to say I've been totally overwhelmed by the responses of Canadians who believe in that basic value of fairness that underpins Medicare. Canadians who want to participate in concrete ways to improve our system. But let's be frank. If we believe in health equity, which I think we do, we need to acknowledge that just as women face bias in the workplace, on campus, and at home, they also face bias in healthcare. Bias that finds its roots in the most basic structures of our systems and our processes. So today, I'm here to introduce you to a new big idea, one that isn't in the book, and that's the concept of the health gap. I'm here to ask you to join me in naming the health gap, understanding its consequences, and taking action to close it. Now, the women who have stepped forward in the Me Too movement, of course, are standing on the shoulders of people across the gender spectrum who've advocated for gender equity for generations. So I'd like to introduce you to one such person, a person on whose shoulders I stand as a Canadian woman physician. Meet Dr. Emily Stowe, the founder of Women's College Hospital. In 1865, the vice principal of the University of Toronto School of Medicine flatly denied entry to a young Emily Stowe, and his exact words to her were, the doors of the university are not open to women, and I trust they never will be. At that moment, Emily committed to doing everything in her power to ensure that one day, women like me would be able to study and practice medicine in Canada and that Canadian women would have the option to receive their health care from women physicians if they so chose. So she left Canada to pursue her medical training in the U.S., and two years later she came back here to Toronto, and she opened the very first medical practice run by women and for women. Now she probably could have stopped there, I mean frankly that would have been enough, but she saw for herself a bigger obligation a duty to change the structures in the medical, profession, the medical profession and across our institutions of higher learning. She understood that you can't have a healthy society if you don't have a just society. So she campaigned to open a medical college for women, a space where women could practice medicine for the first time in Canada and where women could receive their care from women physicians. And in 1883, Women's Medical College was born just up the street from here. It was around that time that Emily declared, the day will dawn when woman will equal man, not only in the medical profession, but in every other position in which she is qualified to excel. Her, re her vision was revolutionary for her time, and we have continued that revolution. Women's College Hospital continues its razor-sharp focus on research, care, and education that takes into account sex and gender differences. And our work is not done. I argue that much of the inequity that continues to persist in our broader society both causes and contributes to and is caused by the health gap for women. So what is the health gap and why should you care? Well, just as we see income gaps and participation gaps along gender lines in our society, we also face substantial health gaps. Healthcare doesn't work the same for everyone. We're not all built the same from research to treatment options to access to services and programs, 
many women are overlooked and underserved because healthcare has not traditionally considered the impact of sex and gender differences. I mean, if you study a medication in men, it must work in women, right? If you design a service that works for men, it must work for women, right? Not so. You probably already know that gendered wage gaps persist across our society. Last year, Statistics Canada reported that women working full-time in Canada still earn 74 cents on the dollar that full-time workers, male workers make. But you may not know that until the 1990s, women were not included at all in most medical research studies. And even today, many commonly used prescription drug therapies have not been adequately studied in women. This discrimination has led to standardized medication dosages and treatment approaches that are totally inappropriate for women's bodies, inappropriate treatments for a range of health challenges. Just as an example, every year, heart disease kills more women than men, but only a third of patients in heart disease research studies are women. Early signs of a heart attack, which are different often in women than in men, are missed in nearly 80% of women. And once a woman has a heart attack, she is far less likely to be referred for life-saying cardiac rehabilitation than her male equivalent. A Heart and Stroke Foundation report that just came out last week, some of you may have seen, confirmed that heart disease is under-researched, under-diagnosed, and under-treated in women as compared to men. And that's just heart disease. Whether it's mental health, chronic pain, addictions care, stroke care, or cancer care, we are systematically and systemically creating and perpetuating gender gaps all across our healthcare system. Furthermore, we know that the biggest determinants of health are social and economic. People below the poverty line are much more likely to experience health challenges, whether it's arthritis or diabetes, uh, heart disease, and at the same time, they're less likely to be able to easily access treatment. But did you know that women are substantially more likely than men are to live below the poverty line? The health gap is very much an extension of, and in many ways a symptom of, the bigger social conversation that we are trying to have right now about gender equity. So, the health gap is real, and it matters. What are we going to do about it? Of course, raising awareness is important, but we've got to do a lot more than raise awareness. From research to education to the way that we design our services, we have to walk the talk of change. This is where I really believe that my organization, Women's College Hospital, is still leading the way. In the early days, that meant pioneering the invention of the PAP test. It meant opening the first sexual assault and domestic violence center in Ontario. Today, it means running the first heart health program in Canada de designed exclusively for women. It means running the largest research and clinical program for women's mental health in the nation. It means launching the first trans-surgical program in the province of Ontario. And beyond delivering high quality health care for women, it also means championing women in leadership. Over 70% of our leadership team are women, and women dominate both our hospital and our foundation boards. There are not very many organizations in the public or the private sector where that's the case. We have a strong tradition of women supporting our hospital from volunteers to longtime $5 a month donors to million dollar donors. Our modern publicly funded healthcare system was founded on the belief that access to healthcare is a right not a privilege. When we created Medicare in this country, we committed to taking care of one another. As a family doctor, I believe really deeply in that promise, and I've made it my life's work to try to improve our system and to make it more worthy of the immense pride that Canadians have in it. Our promise has got to take into account the reality that not everyone starts out with the same chances of being healthy. Our opportunity is tremendous. Women who receive health care that meets their unique needs are more likely to pursue an education and earn a living wage. They're more likely to live longer and to contribute to a robust, growing economy. But closing the health gap is no easy feat. Shifts in social structures, including the structures of the health care system, have never been easy to bring about. Change, as you all know, is hard to create. For us at Women's College, Creating change has meant decades of engaging women and their supporters 
about what they need and what they want to contribute. It's meant championing women in leadership, recognizing our contributions, and ensuring that we are sitting at the table when decisions are made. Today, I want to ask you to join us, to join Women's College Hospital in recognizing the gaps that women continue to face in our society and to continue to try to close those gaps, wage gaps, safety gaps, health gaps, and many more. We need to invest our money and our energy in causes and organizations that will improve health for women and advance women in leadership. It was easier for me to advance than it was for Dr. Emily Stowe. I want it to be easier still for my daughter. And of course, Dr. Stowe didn't do it alone. We need our community, including the men in our community, to line up behind this big idea and work with us together to close the health gap. Thank you.